where we're up to in terms of this specific project, what the next couple of years are going to look like in the life of the Bloodhound Project. So um, I'll show you a few movies. I'm sure some of these lots of you will have seen before, but I'd just like to remind you um, one of the important questions about this project is, well, why are we doing this? Okay, we're designing the world's fastest car, a car that's going to travel at a peak speed of 1,050 miles per hour, in theory. Um, why on earth are we doing that? That's the first question I'm going to try and answer. I'll then uh, take a little look at some of the specific um, research that we've been doing here within the college um, that has influenced the design of the car. Okay, the design is now frozen, so the car that I'll show you at the end is the car that we're now building. And then we'll have a little look um, at the future of the project over the next two, possibly three years. So first of all, um, before I say any more, I'm just going to show you a short movie that hopefully explains why we're doing this. This is the most extraordinary project I've ever, ever been involved in. Um, what we're doing is creating the, uh, the most advanced land speed record car that's ever been built. Bloodhound SSC has a very unusual objective for a land speed record project. It's not to set a speed or even a new record. It's to get everybody, everybody from 6 to 96 years old, interested and excited by mathematics, engineering, science, technology. The objective here is to, um, is to share the project and all its technology as widely as we possibly can. But the key thing to all this is education. Whether it could be bridges, whether it could be fashion, it could be fast cars, people love engineering. I am a Royal Air Force fighter pilot, but first and foremost, I'm a mathematician. And that is a way I not only think about the numbers, the incredible numbers involved with flying fast jets from day to day, but also the truly astonishing numbers that Bloodhound SSC is throwing up. Just to give you an idea, the bodywork at these speeds has got to take loads of the order of 12 tonnes per square metre. I mean, it's got to be as tough as a submarine. Nobody's ever done anything like this before. When we are accelerating this car, it's going to be peaking at 3G, 60 miles an hour per second. At peak speed, it will be covering the length of four football fields per second. The wheel rims will be experiencing 50,000 radial G at the rim. Those sorts of numbers are truly astonishing, and if you don't understand them, truly frightening. And as the driver, actually, that's not a good thing. I'm in the lucky position, as the world's fastest mathematician, of being able to understand and be comfortable with those numbers, understand the engineering solutions. We have to remember that this is an adventure. It's an engineering adventure. We don't know what the final outcome is going to be. And uh, even if we don't get to 1,000 miles per hour, it won't necessarily be a failure if what we have done is inspire people. There's going to be a huge industrial revolution. And to cope with this, we've got to have the scientists. We've got to have people studying mathematics, science, engineering. Because basically, unless we do this, Britain simply isn't going to be able to play. Um, so it's all pretty dramatic, it's all very exciting. What we are trying to do is astonishingly ambitious, and there's a good reason why we're doing this. We're doing this to try and inspire a new generation of engineers. I know I'm preaching to the converted here, so I won't bang on about that. Um, but just to bring you back to the point of how ambitious this is, this, this chart hopefully will give you a little flavour of exactly what we're trying to do in terms of increasing the speed of uh, or the, the, the record, which is the land speed record. The current record um, is this car here, Trust SSC, 763 miles per hour, the first car officially to go faster than the speed of sound. Okay, so it just topped uh, Mach 1. We're going to take Bloodhound in principle up to about Mach 1.3. It depends on the temperature on the day, it could be as high as Mach 1.4. Um, but we're pushing into a whole new speed regime where actually if we get a record of 1,000 miles per hour, it'll be the biggest leap in the land speed record by a single vehicle um, in the history of the world land speed record. So what we're doing is incredibly ambitious. Technically, what's so difficult about this? Um, well, I guess in comparison with the fluid dynamics that Dr. Masters has just been talking to you about, which is very much incompressible flow, okay? Um, one of the big challenges for us in terms of modeling this computationally is the fact that the flow 
uh, regime that we enter into is fundamentally compressible. Okay, so what's the significance of that? Now I'm guessing it's a fair assumption that you all came to the university today in a subsonic vehicle. Is, is that a fair <laughs> assumption to make? Um, I drive around in a 1.1 litre Fiat Panda, um, which is hard to believe. I'm designing the fastest car in the world and driving a Fiat Panda. Um, that's definitely a subsonic vehicle. So as we travel around in our subsonic vehicles, our subsonic bicycles, our subsonic cars, we're constantly sending information forward in the form of sound waves, or pressure waves. These sound waves travel at the speed of sound, which on a day like today is probably about 750, 760 miles an hour. So I'm driving along the Mumbles Road at 30, 40 miles an hour, throwing these sound waves forward at about 750 miles an hour, and those sound waves essentially are telling the air particles, the air molecules that are ahead of me, Ben's coming in his Fiat Panda, you're going to have to start moving out of the way. Like, obviously they don't have that much specific information about me and the car, but they, they know that something's coming, they know they have to start moving out of the way. The air particles part, allow my Fiat to move through, and then they just fill in the space behind me. And that's the situation you've got, the top right picture there. Okay, everybody's happy, the air is happy, my car's happy, um, and everything happens nice and smoothly. Of course, as we go faster and faster and faster and faster, and approach the speed of sound, and pass the speed of sound, it gets impossible, it becomes impossible for those sound waves to move away from the car. So as I, if I'm travelling at 750 or faster, I'm throwing that information forward, trying to tell the air ahead of me I'm coming, but I'm constantly catching up with those waves that I'm sending forward. So instead of things happening nice and smoothly, as happens in the world of subsonic aerodynamics, things happen very suddenly. Things, you suddenly have these very non-linear features in the flow, um, which we typically call shock waves, okay? Um, so we're going to be generating shock waves, which is extremely unique for a vehicle travelling this low to the ground. In fact, a vehicle travelling, we hope, on the ground. Okay? Uh, there are lots of aircraft that travel faster than the speed of sound and generate shock waves. But they're up in, up in the sky, so those shock waves can dissip dissipate out into space. They get broken up because of viscous effects, um, and everything's okay. What we've got to try and model is the fact that we're going to be generating these shock waves very close to the surface. They're going to be interacting with the desert that we're going to be running the car across. And these have been some of the really big challenges that we've had to overcome in terms of trying to model this. So how have we done it? Um, that computer that Dr. Masters was talking about earlier, the room with all the boxes in it, that's the computer there. Okay? It's a PC cluster. Essentially what this thing is, um, is a whole bunch of PC type processors. Okay? The, the actual processors in there are exactly the same as the kind of processors in a desktop or a laptop, but they just wire together in a very clever way so they can talk to each other extremely efficiently. Traditionally, this is how we might have done this kind of aerodynamic analysis. Okay? Formula One cars, Formula One teams still use um, this kind of technology, wind tunnel analysis, where you can spin the wheels of the car, um, you can roll the road underneath the car, so you can incorporate the, the, the effect of having those parts moving. Um, the problem is, with this method for us, well, A, there simply are no supersonic wind tunnels in the world where you can roll the floor and model the rotation of the wheels. Second of all, this is extraordinarily expensive to do. Okay? So we use this thing called CFD, um, and the research group um, that I'm a part of um, is one of the world leading groups in this, this area of CFD, computational fluid dynamics. And essentially, just hang in there now when I show you the next slide, okay? If you're still in level one, don't freak out and leave the university, okay? Um, these are the equations that we're solving, okay? Um, these are the governing equations of compressible uh, aerodynamics. They're called the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, if you're an aerospace engineer, um, at some point you're going to encounter these, I'm afraid, okay? And they look horrific. Um, in many ways, they are horrific. I first encountered these as a 19-year-old, as an undergraduate, and they basically haunted me for the last decade. Um, but they're based on some pretty simple principles, principles that you would have known about before you even came to university. So the first equation up there is just a statement of conservation of mass. Okay? These three equations here are statements of conservation of momentum in the three-dimensional world in which we live. And this final statement here is simply conservation of energy. We have five equations, okay? and luckily, in the world of aerodynamics, at every point in space, there are always five unknowns that we wish to solve for. The density of the air, it's compressible, um, the density can change, and the three components of the velocity of the air, um, and the temperature of the air, or the internal energy of the air. So we've got five unknowns, five equations, in principle we can solve these things. Okay? In reality that's incredibly difficult to do. In fact, there's, there's a mathematics institute in America right now that's offering a prize of one million dollars to anybody who can come up with an, a unique general analytical solution for these equations. So some of you might want to start scribbling now, uh, because that could be your future, you never know. So, so what we do in the world of CFD is come up with 
approximate solutions. Um, and typically we want to apply um, those equations to complex geometries. And one of the things that um, the, the research team that I work with here really got famous for is, is developing techniques for applying CFD technology to extremely complex geometries using unstructured grids. And this is still a really popular area of research. There are still a lot of people on the corridor that I work on, including myself, who are trying to develop um, a more efficient, quicker, more accurate techniques um, for doing this kind of thing. Okay. So what does the process look like? How does the research that we're doing here in CFD algorithms um, meshing technology, um, talk to what's going on with the Bloodhound project, which is based in Bristol. Um, how does that process look? Well, first of all, we here in the university have developed the fundamental algorithms for solving those equations. Okay? And again, as, as you move through the course to level two, level three, you'll start encountering some of these things. Um, and potentially, these could be the kind of things you would end up doing if you, if you stayed on to do research here. Um, but the project has to supply me with a geometry, okay? Um, typically that's in the form of uh, a CAD file, an output file from a CAD system. I can take that and then feed that into our mesh generators. Um, I can start thinking about where I think some of the interesting aerodynamic phenomena are going to be happening around uh, the, the geometry. Um, so I can specify where I want lots of elements within this mesh. I'll talk to you a little bit about meshing in just a moment. Um, once I've generated a mesh, I can then pass that mesh on to the CFD solver, okay, after I've done some analysis to make sure this mesh is of sufficient quality to yield what I would believe to be accurate results. We can then study uh, the solution